All right. So yesterday, yesterday we left off talking about this idea of where the energy comes from to drive this system of the, the ball hanging over on the pulley, okay, attached to that block there that's sitting on the table. Okay? And we said it, it's the potential energy of the ball that's going to drive the system. Okay? In other words, energy that drives something is capable of doing work. Okay? So the work to make this thing happen is going to come from here. That is exactly why this ball will not fall at 9.81 meters per second squared. Okay? It can't because... Yeah, because it's attached to the blue box, okay? The blue box is going to produce, uh, or is going to steal some of its energy, okay? The, the red ball has to do work in order to change the energy of the blue box, because when the blue box is stationary, it has no kinetic energy. When the, when the red ball falls, the blue box will gain some energy. The only place for it to gain energy from is the red ball. Okay? Therefore, the red ball has to lose some energy. The blue box has to gain it because the red ball is going to do work through the string and pulley on the blue box. Everyone okay with that? I feel like you know, Dr. Seuss red ball blue box. Yeah. Um, anyway, okay, so that's, that's what's going to happen there. Is the total energy of this system going to change? No. Okay. When we start this system before the ball drops, and I think we went over this yesterday, I can calculate the energy in the system. It's the potential energy of the red ball. Okay, So I'll take the mass of the ball, 5 kilograms, multiply it by G, 9.81, and multiply that by um, the height above the ground, Okay, which is 2 meters, which gives me, sorry, that's a terrible color. That's not much better. 98.1 newtons, not newtons, joules. Okay, 98.1 joules worth of energy. When this thing gets moving, there's still going to be 98.1 joules of energy. All that's going to change is where in the system that energy is and what form it's in. Right now, all the energy in this system is in what form? Potential. Once I let go of that red ball, then some of it, some of that potential will turn into kinetic for the red ball. Some of it will turn into kinetic for the blue box, okay, and so on and so on, but it's all still going to be there. Okay, everybody all right with that idea? When you're doing the calculations, is it always kilograms? Yes, math is always in kilograms in physics. Okay, in, regardless of what you're calculating. Okay, Newtons is a kilogram meter per second squared. Joules are a kilogram meter squared per second squared. It's always kilograms. Mass is always going to be in kilograms. Okay, even when we're dealing with things like an electron. Okay, we put that into like it's uh, 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. Okay. Everything is in kilograms, no matter how small or how big. Okay. Chemistry, different. Chemistry is always about grams, grams per mole, things like that, because okay. they deal with atoms and small stuff. In physics, we go big. Okay. So you can just remember it that way. Chemistry deals with small things, so they measure in grams. Physics goes big. We deal with kilograms. Okay. I know it seems like everyone should be on the same page, and they should. They should be on the physics page, because we're always right. And all science comes from physics. If physics hadn't discovered the atom, there'd be nothing to do in chemistry. Okay? And all biology is, is applied chemistry, which came from physics. So, All right. Every science teacher has a different reasoning for why their science is the most important, but ours is right. Okay. Um, so we can calculate gravitational potential energy okay, by this calculation. And we've already gone over that. Okay, Mass times the acceleration due to gravity times the height above whatever reference point, usually the ground, okay? And that height is always measured in meters. Obviously, this is for basically 99% of the calculations you're going to do, going to be 9.81 meters per second squared, and the mass will be whatever it is in kilograms, okay? And then obviously, EP is the gravitational potential energy in joules, okay? Now, we abbreviate the actual units for energy as joules, okay? There's two reasons for that. It's an abbreviation and it's shorter. And secondly, it's to kind of pay homage to, uh, you know, Joule who did all this, you know, studies of energy and things like that, okay? A Joule really, if we look at what we're multiplying here, okay, the mass is in kilograms, G is in, is, um, in meters per second squared, okay, and height is in meters. 
So kilograms times meters times meters gives me kilogram meters squared. And on the bottom, I've got seconds squared. That's a joule, okay? A kilogram meter squared per second squared. Thankfully, you never have to write it that way, okay? And in fact, I don't always remember exactly what the fundamental units are until I do something like that to figure them out, okay? Most of the time, we don't need to remember exactly what they are, okay? This is abbreviated as J, joule. Okay, good question. How do I calculate it for elastic potential energy? Elastic potential energy is uh, one half kx squared. You don't know what these variables are, but I'll tell you. Okay, k is the stiffness of the elastic object. Okay, we call it its spring constant. Okay, so how much? Uh, it's measured in newtons per meter. So how many newtons would you need to of force? Would you need to compress or stretch it by one meter? X is the displacement of the object from its resting or equilibrium position okay so we have this in newtons um newtons per meter okay and we've got x which is squared okay um so that's in meters squared okay and then uh, newton is a kilogram meter per second squared so if i'm going to take newtons out okay that's going to be kilogram meters squared per second meter second squared yeah so obviously this goes away, that goes away. Okay, we end up with, sorry, kilograms, not, that's not squared, sorry. Kilogram meters per second squared. Okay, so the, the meters cancel there and I get kilogram meters squared per second squared, same, same units. Okay, same with kinetic energy. Okay, kinetic energy is one half MV squared, right? So if we're looking at that, that's kilograms times speed squared. Okay, speed squared is meters squared per second squared, kilogram meters squared per second squared, okay. Did I just confuse the hell out of you? Okay, you don't need to worry about this, okay. This one you'll have to do, okay. This is kinetic energy, what you have due to your speed, okay. All I did was take the units for mass, okay. The units for mass are kilograms, and I multiplied them by the units for speed squared. The units for speed are meters per second, but I have to square them, so that's meters squared, second squared. And I get the same units I did up here, joules, okay? They all come out to the same units because they all measure the same thing, energy. All right, not something you're gonna have to worry too much about, okay? All right, so let's look at an example here of like a, a very basic potential energy problem, all right? So I have a three kilogram box lifted by an upward force one and a half meters above the surface of the earth to the top of a table. What is the potential energy of the box in its new position? All right, so they gave me the mass, okay? They gave me the height. What did they not give me? Right, they don't have to because they said it was above the surface of the earth, okay? And as a result, then 9.81 is a given because it's on your formula sheet and it's just something you should know, all right? Uh, so we got EP equals M times G times H is our formula. We take our mass, three kilograms, multiply it by G, multiply it by H, and we find that that thing now has 44.1 joules of potential energy. Okay, everybody all right with that one? Manipulating this formula. How hard is that gonna be? Not hard, okay? The only operation going on here is multiplication. So if I wanna solve for G, I divide the other two things. I wanna solve for H, I divide by MG. Whatever I gotta move, I just divide it, okay? It's a really easy formula to manipulate because there's only one operation going on in it, okay? All right. Second example, if you are standing on the diving platform, okay, so if you've ever been to one of those Olympic uh, like swimming pools that has the 10 meter high diving platform, okay, um, if you're standing up there and you have a mass of 55 kilograms, you would have 5,400 joules worth of energy, okay, that's what 5.4, let's go over that, that's something that's going to come up over and over again, okay, scientific notation, I've written this number in this way, what's 10 to the 3? What's 10 cubed? 1,000. So this is saying 5.4 times 1,000. If I want to multiply by 1,000, how many spots do I move the decimal? Three. Right? That's all you have to do with scientific notation. Okay? The exponent tells you how many spots to move the decimal. 
Simple as that. Our numbering system is a base of 10. Okay, so that makes it easy. All right, so I've got 5,400 joules. I'm looking for the vertical height of the platform, right? So we just said to do that, we go EP equals M times G times H. I'm solving for H. So I divide both sides by M times G and H is by itself. Okay, plug in my numbers, 5,400 joules divided by, and this would have to be done in brackets. Otherwise, your calculator will go 5,400 divided by 55 and then multiply by 9.81, which is not what we want. Okay, so when you're manipulating and you're moving two things over at the same time, you kind of move them over in brackets. Okay, so the vertical height is going to be 10 meters. Okay, so you're on top of the 10 meter diving platform. Don't do a belly flop off of that one. It hurts. And you like you have like pins and needles for hours afterwards. Yeah. Oh yeah, you could you could conceivably snap your neck. Yeah. yeah. They actually have um they have like a belly flop contest. Have you ever watched that? They had it on TSN once. The National Belly Flop Contest. Okay. And and these really big guys like jump off not the 10 meter, but okay, like the five meter, and they they see how much water they can displace from the pool. <laughs> well, you can't win that if you're if you're really really skinny, you can't win the belly flop because you can't displace enough water when you hit the water. Okay, it's about how much water you can displace when you hit the water. Okay, and actually, the guy who's the basketball coach of the senior girls team in Chestermere was for a time the national belly flop champ. Yeah. Okay, now we're going to talk about kinetic energy, okay? Potential energy, you know, is something that's less evident, and it's also, to an extent, less useful. I can't really make potential energy do anything, okay? Not until it's converted into kinetic. Once something's moving, then it can do work. Something sitting still can't really do anything. It has the potential to do something only because it has the potential to turn into kinetic energy and become useful, okay? Um, so if something has kinetic energy, it can do more obvious work, okay? So when the potential energy of an object is released, that object often begins to move, okay? And moving objects obviously can do work. You can use a, a hammer to drive a nail into wood. Moving molecules in hot steam can turn a turbine, okay? Uh, moving molecules in a sound wave make your eardrum vibrate, okay? So when a sound wave is coming towards you, okay, a couple of things are detected by your ear. Firstly, how close together are the sound waves? If they're really close together, you hear high or low pitch. High pitch, right. If they're far apart, you hear a low pitch. Okay. And if they are making the air molecules move a great deal, that is, they have a large amplitude, they are very loud. Okay. Amplitude measures measures volume on a sound wave. Okay. So the if you've ever watched like um, a subwoofer, because it's about the only speaker you can see move. Okay. Um, if it's not very loud, the subwoofer hardly moves at all. When it's cranked, the subwoofer is moving a lot, okay? It's displacing a lot of air. In fact, if you sit in front of it, you can feel the air that it's pushing, okay, with the cone of the speaker moving back and forth, okay? Your worry, of course, is that your eardrum is a very thin flap of skin attached to a whole bunch of bones in the middle ear, okay? And if you make it move too much, you can... Uh, you can wreck the joints between the little tiny bones in the middle ear, okay? And that can result in hearing loss. So the next time you're in your buddy's car and I can hear you coming from a mile away, okay? You know, it's probably, it's probably not all that good for your ears. And honestly, guys, it's your generation that's going to have more hearing problems than any other, okay? You know, you guys, you guys know why? Portable electronics have been the kind of mainstay of your generation, okay? I mean, how you guys have basically always had access to, okay, music that's portable, right? My generation kind of, we started that. We had the Walkman, which was like carrying around a yellow brick, okay? And you put a tape in it, right? And then and, and if you put four AA batteries, you could listen to your tape for an hour and a half before you had to put more batteries in, okay? It's nothing like what you guys have, okay? And our headphones didn't go in our ears. They were these big orange foam things, okay, that sat on the outside, okay? And, and they didn't, you know, transmit sound into the ear canal nearly as well as the headphones that you guys have, okay? 
And of course, you guys use them a lot more than we ever did because your, the batteries in your equipment last a lot longer. So you guys are most likely to have more hearing problems than previous generations did, okay? Simply because of what you do to your ears all the time. So think about that when you're cranking up the volume on your favorite song, okay? Um, you might want to hear your children laugh. Okay. It's not meant to be funny. It's meant to make you think, okay? The most beautiful sound in the world is the sound of your child laughing, okay? And you will want to hear that at some point. I'm not saying rush out and have children so you can hear them laugh before you go deaf, okay? I'm saying don't go deaf, okay? All right. So going to show you a couple of examples here of people using kinetic energy to break stuff, okay? Um, the first one... The first video is of this, uh, it's, I don't know, something like uh, maybe like Tai Chi Club or something in, in China where they're just demonstrating a whole bunch of board breaking and, and things like that, okay? And there's some guys who are in, like really, really good at it. They're snapping like fairly thick chunks of wood, okay? And then there's at the end, it's almost hard to watch this very old gentleman, okay, who is punching this, these two pieces of wood and he just can't get it to break, okay? because he's just not hitting it at his full extension. And so he's coming in with lots of power and he's hitting it, but it won't break. So you, you watch this old man keep hitting this, this piece of wood, okay? Now, has anyone ever done, does anyone do martial arts in here where they break boards and stuff? Okay, I mean, there's, there's a lot of technique to that. Don't just think, well, I could do that walk on. <laughs> no, you can't, okay? It's not that you're not strong enough. Lots of people are strong enough to do it, but if you have not practiced the technique, you are going to hurt yourself, okay? Yeah. Oh, it's, yeah. yeah. It Remember, Newton's third law applies here. You hit the wood, the wood hits you back. Okay. So you have to be careful on that. You have to, you know, kind of be at your full extension that it's the, the whole idea of the one inch punch, right? You always aim an inch behind your target. That's where you want, because then you have the most power coming in. If you hit early or without full extension, then you're going to hurt yourself. Okay. Yes. Punch through. Yes. Keep going. Yeah. All right, so I'm going to show you the, the first one here with the breaking of the wood, and then I'm going to show you the guy who holds the world record for broken sidewalk blocks. Okay, he's um he's a war he's a, a war veteran from uh, from the Gulf War. He was blinded by an anti personnel device, um, but uh, he gets guided up onto this big thing where there's 20 some sidewalk blocks, and he breaks them with his forearm. Yeah, it's it's incredible. All right, so obviously kinetic energy can, can do work, okay? But kinetic energy can also be, it can also work against you, right? And that is if your job is to stop. Okay? If your job is to stop, having a lot of kinetic energy is a bad thing because now you have to get rid of that kinetic energy somehow, okay? How do we typically reduce the amount of kinetic energy we have? Okay, you can pass it off to something else or you can convert it to other forms of energy, okay? When you use your brakes, for example, in your car, you are converting kinetic energy into other forms. You're turning it into mostly heat, okay? But maybe a little bit of sound as well, right? But mostly heat. And in fact, okay, what happens when you, when you pile on your brakes, okay, is the calipers, squeeze the discs right onto the rotor. Okay, so you can kind of see, if you ever look in through your wheel, okay, you can see kind of a silver ring inside. That's the rotor for the brakes. That's the thing that the pads squeeze onto, okay? Um, so when you squeeze onto there, there's a lot of friction. And if your car is moving at a high rate of speed, it doesn't take long for those to get really hot, okay? If you ever watch like night racing, okay, you can actually see when, the, when they're approaching a corner, when the cars are approaching a corner, the rotors glow. Okay, there's so much friction in there from this. What they're doing is converting their kinetic energy into heat. Okay, now the formula for kinetic energy is um, is one half mv squared. So what I'm going to do here is go back one. Okay, I'm going to illustrate something to you. Okay, whoop, not ek squared, just ek. Okay. So this, um, this is the formula that calculates how much kinetic energy you have. It is dependent on two things, your mass and how fast you're going, okay? But how fast you're going in this formula is squared, okay? That means any increase in velocity or speed has an exponential effect on the amount of energy you have, 
So if I double my speed, I have four times as much kinetic energy. If I triple my speed, I have nine times as much kinetic energy. Okay, speed has an exponential effect on your amount of energy, which means it also has an exponential effect on how far you will travel before you are able to stop. Okay, so how fast are you supposed to go through a playground or school zone? 30 kilometers per hour. Okay, don't, yes, and yeah, 30, okay. What's that? Okay, note to self. Don't go to Regina. Okay. Um, so speed limit through a playground zone is 30 kilometers per hour, which is 8.3 meters per second. Okay, 8.3 repeating. Okay. So if I'm traveling through a playground zone in an average size car, okay, let's say it's, um, I don't know, 2,000 kilograms, we'll say. Okay, an average size car, 2,000 kilograms. Um, the amount of kinetic energy I have would be, All right, so 0. 0.5 times 2,000 times 8.3 repeating squared. All right, so that's how much kinetic energy my car would have, okay? 69,444 joules worth of energy. Everybody with me there? All right, I have to get rid of that energy by making it do what? Okay. If I'm changing my energy, that, what would we say, a change in energy is work. I have to make this energy do work in order to get rid of it, okay? What's the other way to calculate work? Force times distance, all right? So I can calculate pretty easily how far my car will travel as long as I know the force my brakes are able to exert, okay? So let's say on our average size car, our brakes are capable of exerting somewhere in the neighborhood of 4,000 newtons worth of frictional force, okay? So if I want to find the distance, what do I have to do with F? Right, I have to move it over here. All right, so I divide both sides by F, and we said that F is 4,000 newtons. So that's going to leave me with how far I'm going to travel before I'm able to stop at the speed limit in a playground zone. Yes, what I'm saying here is, okay, sorry, I, sh I should have written the whole thing out, okay? What I'm really calculating here is EF minus EI equals FD. But my final energy is going to be what? Zero, I wanna stop. A kid just ran out in front of me, right? I wanna slam on my brakes and stop, okay? So I don't have any energy at the end. So I'm really just saying my initial kinetic energy is equal to the work I have to do to get rid of it. Okay, everybody with me there? Okay, because work is a change in energy. I want my energy to go from this to nothing. Okay, so that's the amount of work I have to do. All right, so now if I take that 69,444, okay, that I just calculated and divide it by 4,000 joules, okay, that says I'm going to travel 17 meters, 17.36 meters before I stop. That's a long way, even at 30 kilometers an hour. Okay, that's a long way. Probably my my brakes could probably exert more than 4,000 newtons of force, but we're picking a number, okay? What if, um, how fast do most people go through a playground or school zone? Like, I mean, our general kind of, we can justify it in our heads rule is I can go 10 kilometers over the speed limit. That's not a big deal, right? Okay, and if you're going 120 in a 110 zone, nobody thinks about that. Okay, going 60 in a 50 zone, nobody thinks about that, right? It's not that big a deal. It's just 10 kilometers an hour. Okay, what they don't realize is the exponential relationship between speed and stopping distance. Okay, it doesn't make your stopping, an increase of 10 kilometers an hour doesn't increase your stopping distance by a little bit. It almost doubles it. Okay, so we'll do the math on that. If I'm going, um, let's say now 40 kilometers an hour, I think that's 11.1. Can someone just punch in uh, 40 divided by 3.6? I think it's 11.1. Yeah, 11.1 repeating. Okay, so now let's do this calculation, but now I'm going 40 kilometers an hour. So one half times 2,000 
times 11.1 squared, okay, divided by the force my brakes can exert. Okay, so this was my distance before. So now I'm going to go 0.5 times 2,000 times 11.1. Repeating, we'll get about as many ones in there as we had for the other one. Okay, squared. Okay, and then I divide that by the 4,000. Thirty meters, thirty point eight six meters. It's nearly double, and all you did was increase your velocity by twenty five percent. Okay, it makes a huge difference that people just don't realize. Okay, you guys, that ten kilometers an hour, and it's resulting extra. 13 point whatever, 13 and a half meters worth of stopping distance. As a parent, that's the difference between me going home and having dinner with my son or me planning his funeral. It's as simple as that. They won't teach you that in driver's ed because it's too harsh. I don't have any problem with it, okay? Because I'm a parent and it's important to me, okay? Here's the real thing of it. We say, oh, but I got to go a little faster. I got to go 10 kilometers an hour faster, okay? I go 10 kilometers an hour faster. That is 2.8 meters per second faster, okay? So I'm going 2.8 meters per second faster through a, through a playground or school zone, okay? Let's do the math on this. Let's say the school zone is 400 meters long, okay? So my distance is 400 meters, okay? My speed is 8.3 meters per second. The time through the school zone at 8.3 is 48 seconds. Same school zone. Saved yourself 12 seconds. Do you know how many times that 12 seconds is more important than some poor kid? Okay, that's, that's the justification we make in our minds. I just want you to realize there's absolutely zero justification okay, to go 10 kilometers an hour over the speed limit through a playground or a school zone. It's going to save you 12 freaking seconds. Okay, It's not worth it. It's just not. Okay, Now, Let's look at this and say that we're that idiot on Canada's worst driver. What's her name? Crystal, the one from Edmonton that texts all the time and that I like, anyway, just, I just get angry thinking about her. Um, how fast would she go through a school zone? Yeah, actually they did the speed test yesterday where they, they black out the, they black out the speedometer and tell them to go certain speeds. When she thought she was going 30, she was going 60. When she thought she was going 50, she was going 75. When she was, thought she was going 80, no, when she thought she was going 70, she was going 105, okay? She has no concept of speed. So a lot of people though, they do this, right? They're in a rush, whatever. They're on their phone and not paying attention to the fact they've just entered a school zone, okay? And they are now traveling through the school zone at 60, twice the limit, all right? So, Okay, if I'm traveling 60 through a school zone, I'm moving at 16.7 meters per second. So for my car, that means 0.5 times 2,000 kilograms times the answer I just calculated squared divided by the force my brakes can exert. 70 meters to stop. That's the length of the science wing from Mr. Dickey's classroom to Miss Lyon's classroom, okay? That's almost a quarter of the whole school zone if the school zone is 400 meters long, okay? Kid runs out in front of you at that speed, you don't have a chance. Okay? You will not get stopped in time, okay? That's why you have to go 30 in a school zone or a playground zone, okay? You absolutely have to, okay? There's just too much going on and the speed 
exponentially increases your distance to stop. Okay, I don't know why that mathematical relationship isn't taught in driver's ed, probably because people are afraid of math. Okay, in this case, you should be. Math doesn't lie in this case, and math gets somebody killed. Okay, so you got to slow down in those places, especially. Okay, that's why that's why the town of Okotoks reduced the speed limit everywhere in town. Right, there's only a few places in town now where you go anything other than 40. Okay, like uh, Southridge Drive. Northridge Drive, 32nd Street. Those are about the only places now in town, within the town limits that are not 40 or less. Okay, everywhere else is 40 or less. Okay, it's for stopping distance, it's for safety. Okay, all right. Now, next thing, speaking of driving habits that are bad. How important is your reaction time? Very important, Very important. okay. Who's got a phone? I know that's that's like ready. Okay. Okay, we'll do this with Sam. Oh, you're, you're, you're gonna do something for me. You're gonna be my guinea pig. Okay. All right. So what I want you to do is have your right hand off the desk like this, ready to pinch this ruler when I drop it. Okay. So with this will be the control. You can put your phone down and really concentrate on the ruler. Okay. When I drop it, grab it. Yeah. Okay, so it fell 40, okay, I got, it. I got it marked here, 47 centimeters before she grabbed it, okay, when she was alert and paying attention to the ruler. Okay, take out your phone, I want you to send a text to somebody with your left hand, because if you were driving, you'd only be able to do this with one hand, because you'd have to have one hand on the wheel. Can't catch this with your knees, yeah. Okay, so put your hand back out again. Well, you just send your text message. <laughs> well, I hit the ground. You caught it on the bounce. Okay, and that's nothing saying that, you know, there's nothing against the person doing the experiment. It's just you're not paying attention. Okay, she caught it when it had only fallen this far when she was watching it. When she wasn't watching it, it hit the floor, bounced, and she caught it on the rebound. Okay. Her reaction time is significantly less, or sorry, significantly more, okay, when she's not watching what she's supposed to be watching, okay? And that's the thing people don't realize when they text and drive, okay, is that they are missing a lot of space. Guys, at 60 kilometers per hour, if you look away from the road, you miss 16 and a half meters for one second. Okay, at 60 kilometers an hour, if you are not looking at the road, you miss 16 and a half meters. Okay, that's a lot. At 120, you miss 32 meters. Okay, can you imagine that? Like how, how far 32 meters is? If you, if you look away for one second, that's how far you will travel while you are not looking. Okay, it's a big, big deal. Okay, you should not be on your phone while you are driving. Okay. And they found that it was actually texting was worse. Yeah. Yeah. I've actually seen that repeated other times other than, than on uh, Mythbusters. But yeah, they've actually said that distracted driving is you are more dangerous as a distracted driver than you are as a drunk driver. I'm not saying that that means you have a free card to go out and drink and drive, okay? Because obviously that's stupid too, okay? But a person drunk behind the wheel is at least looking out the window, okay? Okay? If you are doing both, which many people unfortunately do, okay, you are taking a loaded gun into a crowded room and shooting. You'll hit somebody. Okay, maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but you will. Okay, it's just a matter of time. Okay, so any moving object, just the little life lessons that get infused into things. Okay, all right, um, any moving object has kinetic energy. Okay, when a solid object moves, all the molecules move in unison. This was the when we talked about the truck yesterday, hitting the truck with the golf club. Okay, if the whole object moves, all the particles move in unison. They all go together. Okay, if the object doesn't move but it vibrates, then all the particles are moving randomly. Okay, 
when the kinetic energy of such an object, or sorry, the kinetic energy of such an object is often called mechanical kinetic energy, okay? Because there's thermal kinetic energy as well, okay? Even when molecules are not physically attached to each other, they can still move together like air molecules in wind, okay? When the wind is blowing, the air molecules are moving all together, and that's why it can blow, blow things around, okay? Okay, this picture here. For a typical roller coaster, okay, you are towed up to the top of the first hill. Okay, that's the highest point on the ride. What are they giving you by putting you up there? Potential energy. Okay, that is where all the mechanical energy that will drive the rest of the roller coaster ride comes from, being at the top. Okay, um, so as you go down this first hill, you're converting potential energy into kinetic. In the perfect physical world, all of it becomes kinetic. Okay, when you're at your lowest point, all of your energy would be kinetic at that lowest point, as long as it was on the ground, okay? And then you'd go, as you start going back up, what happens to your speed? It slows down, because what are you doing with your kinetic energy? You're converting it back into potential, right? So in a roller coaster, what you're seeing is the kind of seesaw effect of potential and kinetic energy converting into each other. Okay. As you go down a hill, your potential turns into kinetic. As you go back up the hill, your kinetic turns into potential. Okay. You go slower, but you're getting higher. Okay. Those two things are related in that way. The total mechanical energy of this roller coaster, however, at any point is it's the same. Okay. The total mechanical energy, remember, okay, from the first day of this unit is the potential energy plus the kinetic energy. Since this whole thing starts out with just potential and we only get kinetic from that, okay, the total amount of energy has always got to be the same number. Okay? All that changes is how much of it is kinetic and how much of it is potential. Okay? So if I start up here with, let's say, a thousand joules of potential energy, I still have a, I have a thousand joules then of, of mechanical energy because I don't have any kinetic. As I move down the hill, I still have a thousand joules of mechanical but more of it is kinetic and less of it is potential, okay? The reason for that, the formulas that we use to calculate them. Okay, at the top of the hill, H is a really big number and V is really small or zero. So all of my energy is potential. As I go down the hill, H gets smaller. So my potential energy gets smaller. But as I go downhill, V gets bigger, okay? And so my kinetic energy gets bigger, but my total remains the same because whatever I lose from here becomes this, okay? So they always add up to the same number. Awesome. Yeah, if they had, if there was any point along the way, like on the Hulk where there's an induction, okay, or an addition of more energy, then they're adding in work. It doesn't, it actually, it's not a tough calculation. You just take this amount of energy and then you add on the work that you did in that section of the track where you added more energy. Okay, we're talking a classic roller coaster where you're towed to the top and that's it. The rest of the ride is unpowered. Okay, um, some of the more modern roller coasters, yes, there are places in the middle where they add some energy on. Okay, so kinetic energy, okay, is calculated one half mv squared. Ek is the energy of the object in joules. M is again the mass of the object in kilograms. V is the speed or velocity of the object okay, in meters per seconds. Okay? And it still gives us the same units, joules, kilogram, meters squared per second squared. Okay? And I already went over that, how that happens. Okay, questions so far? All right, so the things we need to remember here about work and energy. Okay, is that work is the change in mechanical energy. Okay, and that means then that it is um, final minus initial. Okay, but I can expand that out even further because in order to calculate mechanical energy, I have to add what two things together? Potential and kinetic. So really, okay, expanding this out even more, it looks like this. The potential energy final plus the kinetic energy final minus the potential energy initial plus the kinetic energy initial. Okay, that's how I calculate mechanical energy. 
Okay. In science 10, you're basically never going to be asked to calculate a work question that has both kinds of energy in it. Okay. In science 10, the change in energy will be either it's a change in potential or it's a change in kinetic, but never both. Okay. But the first thing we do in physics 20, okay, when we talk about work and energy, is do one where both change. Right. It doesn't actually make it any more difficult. It's just more stuff to plug in. Okay. But the formula isn't any different. All right. Oh, I saved that from the last time I went through that whole spiel. See, there's my 8.3, my 11.1. It's all in there. Okay. Anyway, we already did that. All right. I want you to write down this example here. Okay. It's a work energy theorem problem, and we'll walk through it together. So this question here is very much like how our lab on Monday is going to work. We're going to be stretching a rubber band. Okay. Um, so we have a rubber band that's stretched 0.85 meters. What did they just give me there? They gave me a distance. Okay. So I should write that down as one of my givens. Distance is 0.85 meters by a force of 60 newtons. All right. So they gave me F. At what speed would it propel a point? one, two, five kilogram ball when released. So essentially we're making this a slingshot and we're putting a ball in the rubber band when we pull it back, okay? The mass of that ball is 0.125 kilograms. They want me to calculate the speed it would be released at. So when I stretch the rubber band, what have I done? I've given it potential energy because I've done work. Okay. I've put some energy into the system. Can I calculate how much energy I put into the system? Yes. By doing what? Right. Okay. By using the work energy theorem. Work is a change in energy, which means force times distance equals a change in energy. What kind of energy are they asking about in this question? I know that by stretching the rubber band, I'm putting potential energy in the rubber band, but that's not what they're asking about. They're asking about the kinetic energy of the ball. Okay, How much kinetic energy does the ball have if I'm just holding it in the rubber band? Zero. It's not moving. Okay, Everyone okay with that? Well, when I let it go, the velocity it leaves the rubber band at would be its final velocity. Okay, So what they're saying is you're going to change the kinetic energy of the ball. Okay, That's going to mean um, the final kinetic energy minus the initial kinetic energy. And we just said the initial kinetic energy of the ball is going to be zero because it's not moving when it's in the rubber band. All right. So I've got force times distance equals the final kinetic energy. And the formula for kinetic energy is 1 half mv squared. I'm putting the f in there to denote the final velocity, okay? because we're looking for the final velocity of the ball. So what do we have to do to get final velocity by itself? Before I do that. Not just M, by half of M, right. I got to move the one half and the M over to this side. All right, so they've canceled. That leaves me with VF squared. I only want VF, so what do I have to do to both sides? Square root. Okay, so now I've got my formula for solving for VF. Okay, all I have to do now is plug in my numbers. The force was 60 newtons, the distance was 0.85 meters, and I've got to divide that by one half times the mass, 0 0.125. Okay. Notice that I bracketed both the top and the bottom, okay, because I want the operation on the top to be done before I divide it by the operation on the bottom, okay, and then I enclosed everything in brackets. I could have done it piecemeal and just gone, gone 60 times 0 0.85 divided by 0 0.5 times 0 0.125 and then square rooted the whole thing, but I punched it all in at once, okay. All right, so it's going to leave the rubber band at 28.6 meters per second, which is pretty fast. Okay, that's like 108, something like that, kilometers per hour. 
102, okay, 102, I shouldn't do math in my head, right. pretty fast. All right, does everyone see how that one worked? That is, that is a, a prime example of a work energy theorem question, okay? Setting work equal to the change in energy. Your, your task, your biggest task when doing a question like this is deciding what's changing, kinetic energy or potential energy? Because I already said for you guys, you're never going to have a problem where both change, just one or the other, okay? Work is going to cause a change in either potential or kinetic energy. Once you decide which it is, you set work equal to the change in energy and solve for whatever it was looking for. Okay, we're going to spend some time on this, guys. It is a little bit tricky, but we got some time to work on it. Okay. All right, I want you to try that one. So I've got a tractor that's pushing a rock and it's accelerating it from rest to four meters per second. What kind of energy is changing about the rock? It's kinetic, okay? Kinetic energy is dependent on speed. Doesn't say it lifts the rock, then it would be a potential energy question, okay? But in this case, it increases the speed of the rock. That's a change in kinetic energy, okay? It does that over a distance of 25 meters. All right, so if we're writing down our givens here, okay, we know that VI is zero meters per second, which also means our initial kinetic energy is zero meters per second, or zero joules, sorry, okay? Our final speed is four, meters per second and the distance over which all of this occurs is 25 meters and that the mass of the rock is 550 kilograms. All right, we are doing work and we are changing the energy, the kinetic energy that is, of the rock. Okay, so right now, like you would get a mark for this. Okay, like on an exam, I would give you a mark for identifying that work was done in the question and what kind of energy that work changed, okay? Because that's an important step in solving the question. Okay, the formula for work is force times distance. Change in energy, change in kinetic energy means one half MVF squared minus one half MVI squared, which we already said was zero. So I don't need to bother writing anything else in there. Subtracting zero doesn't change anything. All right. I'm asked to find the force that the tractor exerts. So what do I have to do with D? Divide it over to this side, right? Okay, so can I plug my numbers in now? Yep. So one half times the mass of the rock, 550 kilograms, times the, the final speed of the rock, four squared, okay? Divided by the distance over which the rock was accelerated, 25 meters. All right, so that's going to mean 0.5 times 550 times 16, because that's 4 squared, okay, divided by 25. All right, 176 newtons. That's a pretty pathetic tractor, because that's a really, 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 really small force, okay? Like, if I stood on your chest, you would feel a force almost seven times that much, okay? Yeah. Okay. So it's a pretty pathetic tractor. All right, but you guys, oftentimes when we do questions that are involve the, the perfect physical world, the answers are ridiculously small because there aren't all those other forces that interfere that have to be overcome, like friction and things like that, okay? So our final answer there is 176 Newtons. Pushing a rock around with no friction would be a lot easier than okay, pushing one around where it you know, gets stuck in the ground or in the mud or whatever. Okay, is that making a little bit more sense? Okay, they all set up this way, guys, okay? Your, your work is gonna change one kind of energy. You identify what kind, force times distance equals that change in energy, okay? The skeleton of all of these questions is the same. Okay, okay. Uh, might have time to do one more here. Okay, so this one here, slightly different in that now we're looking at potential energy, right? Okay, we've got a change in potential energy happening in this one because we're looking at a change in height. Okay, so I'll give you a couple minutes on that one. Okay, don't know if I'll get through it or not here, but let's have a look at this. Okay, works a change in energy, right? Was it given forces or distances? distances. Well, it's kind of given a distance, but actually what I'm really given here is a change in the height, right? Okay, um, since it's only asking me to calculate the work, I only need to find the change in energy here. So as long as I can go 
the final potential minus the initial potential, I should be able to calculate the work. Okay, what's the formula for potential energy? MGH. So I'm going to take M times G times HF, the final, minus M times G times HI, the initial. Okay, so that's our 10 kilogram package. Is that what it was? Okay, so 10 times 9.81 times 100 meters, the final height, minus 10 times 9.81 times the initial height, which was 30. Okay, that'll give us our change in energy and thus the work done carried upstairs. All right. We'll talk some more about that tomorrow. And tomorrow's Thursday. Quiz will be posted later. Huh? Um, it might have one acceleration and one easy work question. It's more what I'm thinking. Yeah.